All right then, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a big announcement to make. Due to outrage and public demand, Justin Marshall is on a plane tonight to fly to the UK. You're going to be present, Marshy. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish it was um, for different circumstances, Des, but uh, yes, I'm still heading over to the UK uh, to be uh, around those All Black Test matches. Uh, I won't be involved uh, in it doing TV, but um, still will be great to be back here. I haven't been over to the UK since 2018 uh, to... Um, see rugby played in that part of the world, so looking forward to it. So what are you going to be doing? Uh, basically just working through uh, a lot of corporate um, work that I had uh, organised, so uh, in and around test matches, hospitality, uh, and, yeah, catching up with former teammates, the guys the guys like uh, Tom Shanklin, um, uh, Kenny Logan, um, people like that, they all sort of run hospitality businesses and that, Simon Shaw from England, so... Mertz is floating around over there too. Brilliant. My good old mate George Gregg, and he now lives in London. So I don't think I'll be bored, Dev. Okay. So and when you do this, do you actually mind? Because I've, I know that there are people that that uh, that turn their nose up at this or say, "Oh, I've got to do this." Do you think it, it's a got to do, or do you actually enjoy meeting the people when you're doing it? Oh, I really enjoy it, and it's good interaction. You know, it's just people who uh, you know have passion about the game. Um, obviously, love love watching, but love hearing about the game. And, and the best thing for me is. Again, that ability to reconnect with players, not only that you played with, but players that you played against, because they're all usually involved. It's not usually a one-man band, and um, that's certainly the case with the people that I'm working with. And, and the good part for me as well is I did play over there for six years um, and had a good look around at uh, different and various clubs and um, uh, amongst many different countries as well. And you always uh, have... You know, mates and that that you haven't seen for a while who yeah. are great to catch up with as well. And I just will quote you from the uh, half time in the rugby on the weekend when you saw McCaw and Carter saying, Oh, they're on a they're on a donut, they're on a freebie, those guys don't pay for anything. <laughs> yeah. No, there's uh there'll be some sort of gravy train that those boys That's are it. on. Um, you know they're riding? Yeah, no no doubt, but you know, they, they earned that and and, and uh, I don't think that anyone could debate that and um I see that they made their way into the All Black changing room as well. Um, thankfully, they got in there uh, at a time where, um, you know, they, they managed to get get a, get a victory. It would have been a bit awkward otherwise. I'm just going to play you a, a little quote of commentary. It's just a few seconds. Today in 2015, we beat Australia to win the Rugby World Cup. Here was the last piece of the commentary. Is this the greatest ever era, even for New Zealand? Well, it feels like it right now. Justin, I don't know if it's the greatest ever era, but where are we now compared to where we were eight years ago? Well, we're not there, um, and th th there's no doubt that I think the results are reflective of that. Uh, whether that's been a the catalyst for that has been a decline in the way that the All Blacks are playing, and, and they've lost their mantra a bit, or there's been a significant shift in the rest of the world that they've caught up. Uh, but there's no doubt that through that period, uh, 2011, where we won the World Cup here in New Zealand um, right through to 2015. Uh, there was just a, an incredible run of success. And, you know, that, that was what the, the foundation of, um, you know, World Back Rugby has been built on uh, all the time, you know, creating history, winning um, leaders, lows, rugby championships, winning two series, uh, and then in more recent years, rugby World Cups. Uh, it certainly was a golden era. Um, can I put my finger quite on why we are not uh, that successful anymore and why we are regularly dropping test matches? Um, and, uh, yeah, and when I say put my finger on it, is it our decline or the rest of the world's uh, lift and um, ability to now take the All Blacks on? Uh, I think it's a combo. To be perfectly honest. Now, that sounds like genuine fence sitting. I know that. You're probably smiling away to yourself. But I do feel that the rest of the world have got a lot better, uh, bigger, stronger, better resources, better debt, but I also feel that we have probably lost a little bit of our debt and a little bit of our talent pool is not what it was 10 years ago. Can I add two more things to that? Um, I absolutely endorse that. I also think that the rules, the way the game is now, has clogged it up so much that it just makes it easier not to play, if you know what I mean. Plus, if I give you some names, Franks, Moody, Retallick, Whitelock, Reed. Kano, McCaw, Nonu, Smith, 
Um, you know, you've got Bowden coming off the bench, Dan Carter playing. I mean, these are legendary names of the All Blacks. These are some of the greatest yep. players that we've ever seen. And, and you know, when we lost those players, a lot of them 2015, 16, 17, it takes actually years to before, I believe, the resultant action means that what happens is in five or six years, you feel it. Same as Man United, you know, Alex Ferguson. It took a few years, then you get into the slump. I'm not saying we're in a slump at the moment. But look, that match against Japan was as messy as I've seen from the All Blacks. And you pointed out a week ago, and you're exactly right, play the A team, pick the team. Because look, that team hadn't played for five weeks. They were really disjointed. Now we go to Wales, and this team that is going to be selected for Wales hasn't played for six weeks. So what are we expecting? Right. More of the same? Well, the, yeah, going back to your first point, you know, what, what is very poignant in what you said, and, and I think it's very reflective of where we are right now in New, Zealand, in New Zealand rugby with the All Blacks, is when you bounced out all of those names, think about the combinations that, right. that, that were, were, were very, very good for the All Blacks. The centre combination of Manu and Conrad Smith. The inside backs were Aaron Smith and Dan Carter. But the, the, the loose board trio was Kieran Reid, Richie McCaw, um, and Jerome Kano, and, and, and the locks were the same and so forth, you know. Regular combinations that played together all the time, and they became world record breakers for the amount of appearances they put together as combinations. Look at the current state of the team, and we are still messing around with our centre combination. We are still not entirely sure what our 9 and 10 combo is. That, the loose boards are changing regularly. So that is the reason that we're getting this inconsistent, inconsistent blip. Because we can't get settled on on combos that just formulate the ability to play together, know each other well, and become world class. Um, so that's a big part of the equation. So then you go back to what happened last week. Um, you know, we got a little bit blindsided, I think, by Japan because they were better physically than maybe what a lot of those players were expecting. Uh, they've made a massive shift in that area. They competed across the park. Uh, and again, yeah, there was some genuine rust there, good enthusiasm, but um, a, a real negative mindset when things got going tough of going into the grind rather than trying to be creative. And that's a bit of a concern. And now, bang, not only do these players that went through that but managed to galvanise and get a win, maybe you were your grub with a team spirit and culture, well, that's not going to do anything because the team's going to significantly change, as you rightly said, for guys that haven't played for six weeks. So they're going to have a bit of that rust. Yeah, see, I would have thought that with, you know, after building, <coughs> getting away with it in Melbourne against Australia, turning around at Eden Park with the best performance and scoreline of the season, that you would have just gone, right, that team plays again. I mean, because, you know, that 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 to me is all black succession planning. But, you know, and I don't buy into this thing, Justin, also, that a lot of the commentators or have said afterwards, oh, that wasn't a real all black side. Tukia, um, Tukala, Tuki, Tukiaho, Ritalik, Papali'i, yep. Kane, Frizzell, Aaron Smith, Mwanga, Caleb, Reese, Christie, Tuipaluto. I'll go on. That's 11 names I've just given you who have all been first choice starters in the 23 for our major test matches. Don't tell me that wasn't a, a, an All Blacks best team because all of those players are our best players. Yeah, and all of those players, obviously, Ian Foster believe are capable of winning that test match and winning it comfortably or winning it in style. Um, but they, they didn't, and, and they struggled. And, and like I said, you know, you have to uh, give credit to the opposition because they were very, very good, and they've done their homework on the All Blacks. But you would expect that now. Every, but, you know, also there's a, there's a little bit of that aura of fear that's missing, and I think Michael Lich alluded to it, that, you know, the All Blacks used to have this massive mistake of invincibility and unbeatability about them. Um, but because they have been regularly being toppled over recently, other teams go, you know what, hang on. I don't think it is that tough a nut to crack. Let's have a genuine dig at this. If we get stuck into them, um, you know, we, we, we can break them down. And I think because of that, you know, that, that, that that's helping the opposition. But in terms of, yes, our own performance, there's enough firepower there. There's enough experience within that side that Ian Foster named to not get ambushed and to, to, to not go insular when the going got tough, which they did. They went correct. Look, at the end of the day, they still, when they needed to, they got together, they fought hard, uh, they were down to 14 men, defensively had to come up with some big plays, and they did, um, which is re which is rewarding. The, concern, the biggest concern for me, Marty, was when I saw uh, and heard, so I saw it in print, and then I, but I also heard it come out of Ian Foster's mouth, that he was pleased with the way they played. Yeah, and yeah. 
Yeah. There was just not enough creativity, not enough uh, deception, um, not enough positiveness out there for me. Uh, when things got tough, we resorted to pretty aimless kicking and became negatively mindset when we were just trying to get the scoreboard um, pushing ahead by just going direct, one out runners, um, one pass, two passes at the most. Whereas that, that's not the way we play. See, the we, worry we for me... We can't play like that against those... Those we sorry, but but we but we cannot play against uh, that style of game against these big teams in the UK because they're too physical. We just run into traffic and we'll run into problems. Yeah, see, what was concerning for me is I thought that. Hang on a second, it looked like we were playing Argentina and Christchurch again. That directionless, where all they're doing is making one-on-one yep. tackles. Everyone can do that. Every single player in rugby is going to stop you one-on-one. Apart from obviously, you know, if you get. Um, Samasoni, you know, against Stearns, and you get Caleb on a one-on-one. But most of the time, they will stop you one-on-one. So, look, I mean, it's easy to bag the team. It's really easy to hammer the, this, you know, the selectors. But what we want to see is you want to see improvement, don't you? I think we've absorbed what we've seen this year and been pretty unhappy about it. But what you're always hoping for is that we've turned the corner. I looked at that and I thought, my God, maybe we haven't turned the corner. Yeah, and, and I don't think it's actually bagging. I actually think it's frustration. But that's what I'm feeling. I'm feeling this frustration of seeing all that talent out there and the ability that we have to play, but but not not playing the way that all black players instinctively play. We're, we're going we're going into a, a mindset and a, and a, and a, a frame of, um, I guess, pattern out there where, where we look afraid to play at times. And when it gets a little tough, we're not prepared to roll our sleeves up and, 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 and get in the fight, and particularly in our own half. The best we looked was when we took on South Africa at Ellis Park, where we were massive underdogs after getting resoundingly beaten the week before, and we're quite prepared to play from all parts of the field. And when we kicked, we only kicked when necessary, and we kicked accurately, and we put them under pressure. I, I haven't seen that since. Um, we can bully Australia, and I've always said that, and you know that. So physically, we can beat them up. So they, they, they are a different prospect. It puts us in a false mindset when we... When we go, oh, the All Blacks are fine now because they beat Australia by 40 points. Because in my, in my mind, are always a team we can out physical. So, you know, why are we not playing regularly that style of game that we're so used to seeing? How many times in that game did you see Caleb, Caleb Clark get the ball with five or six metres to wind up in space on his wing? No, see, this is the, and this he is the, had to come looking for it. Yeah, and this is the this is the same problem we that I have. Very narrow in Eric. Yeah, well, this is the same problem that I have with with uh, Roger Trevisar Sheck. Is that you know I haven't seen nearly enough times this year where he's got the ball with some space in front of him. You talked about this on this program before, mate. That you know these guys need some room in front of them. If you've got a player right in front of your face, well, there's only one way to go, and that's sideways, unless you know, or you drop to the ground or something. What aren't we doing yeah. to actually create that? You know, half a meter or a meter. Yeah, look, no, I, I think it was great to hear Carlos speaking because we had him on Skype. It was brilliant. Again. He was brilliant. Yeah, and he, he was he was saying the same thing. Why are we playing so narrow? Why why are we making the field so we're reducing the width where our strength is out wide? We're not using any, and and I totally agree. We weren't really using any transition runners out the back. We weren't showing any depth when that line speed was coming at us. To, go, to give some return balls or to have some players in motion, um, what he, he, he was call, he was calling sort of uh, I can't actually remember the name he used. Or I call it a transition runner, but he, he was basically bang on saying, "Yeah, where where are where are where's that deception?" You know, Japan were doing that. Uh, the only thing I can put my finger on is they were holding themselves back. But bloody hell, why? Would no, they? you don't. They, they, that's rubbish. They don't you don't. Show Tell me when you held yourself back. Tell, tell me in a black jersey when you held yourself back, and I'd say rubbish. Bollocks, mate. You don't hold yourself. Yeah, well, no, well, in terms of, I mean, maybe they didn't, they were worried about these players that haven't played for a while. They went with a reasonably narrow, direct mindset of a game plan, and they also probably didn't want to show maybe some of the innovations and, the, and that that they're going to use against these three sides when they get to Europe. That's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping... That's why we played the way we did. That's all I'm going to say. All right, because, I mean, if you're talking about... If it's, if, it's, if it's not that, bloody hell, we have to be asking some big questions. Uh, if it's not innovation, that line-out move where Roger catches the ball, I don't want to see that against England, OK? Oh, that's not innovation to me. That's risk, and that says to me that they're going to score off that. I don't want to see that again. It was fine against Japan. Yeah. As far as the Women's World Cup goes, Justin, the reality is, mate, is that 
we're now seeing a tournament. There was always only going to be three games in this tournament which were really competitive and contestable. And now we play France and then the winner of that plays England. I'm not disrespecting the tournament. It's just a reality of it. But the average score of the quarterfinals was 42-6. They were all blowouts. Mm. So... So what are you seeing from our side? The Black Ferns look magnificent, but are we going to get the ball? And and have we had enough games against teams that have tested us to a point where we can now take on these two teams that belted us so bad last year? I think probably more importantly, and you're, you're bang on, there, there hasn't been enough pressure. The most amount of pressure the Black Ferns came under was in that first game against Australia where they got behind quite significantly early. And it was good to see that they had the result just to, to stick by their mojo and, and, and get their game back in, into action. But obviously they can't, um, they can out physical Australia. Um, so that, will, that that does help in that regard. They won't be able to do that against France and England. But I think most importantly, they are well coached and I, I do know Wayne Smith incredibly well. I'm hopeful that he's not going to enter into this mindset of this all this chat about the fact that well, the France and England can out physical us, we can't scrum, we can't do this, we can't do that. Because quite simply, they can. So what you've got to do is think, right? We're going to we're going to get the odd scrum penalty. We're going to get pushed around every now and then. But that we can't enter into playing that style of game because they look so much better when they use the ball. And it, Jesus, it's going to sound like I'm talking about the All Blacks, but yeah, true. They, they look the, the Black Ferns look such. A, they, they've got to play intuitively. They've got to play instinctively, like. They have been um, through the pool games and all that. Yeah, they're going to have to up their, their tempo at that, at that set piece, etc. But still, they, they don't want to enter into an arm wrestle against France and England of a set piece orientated game. So hopefully, geez, I won't be holding my breath about the weather in Auckland, but hopefully <laughs> they get dry conditions yep. and the, the ball gets into the hands of Ruby Tour with, uh, and Woodman and co. Because that's where we need to attack those sides.